Hello, my name is Georgiana Vladulescu, and I am here today with Adrian Tchaikovsky, author of Children of Time and Children of Ruin, that were translated in Romanian in the Armada imprint. Hello, Adrian. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. So the first question I want to ask is about the aliens in your novels. You chose to write about spiders and octopi, which are usually viewed as evil, especially in fantasy. There's a big bad spider and a big kraken at the sea that are dangerous. <laughs> so in your books, you turn them, uh, you turn the trope uh, on its head and uh, they are sentient and smart and ultimately just as good as bad as humans. So I was wondering why this choice, why spiders and octopi? Um, so the, there's, I've got a whole series of different answers um, to this one. First of all, there is a there's a tradition, as especially sort of an East European literate, literate tradition of using um, insects, especially as a, a mirror to human nature. So we've got um, we've got Kafka and we've got Pelavin and we've got um, Chapek, and that that struck me as it, you know it's it's a it's always nice to be part of a literate literate tradition to a certain extent. Beyond that, though. I have always really, really liked and identified with insects and spiders and octopi, octopuses, rather. And for that matter, just about anything that people don't, most people don't like. I kind of, uh, because I think I've always felt of a, as a bit of an outsider myself, mm -hmm. um, I've always gravitated to the, uh, to the animals that don't have a good PR campaign, you know, because I feel, you know, sort of bunnies and cats and things like that have, have enough people rooting for them. Um, beyond that, though, these books in particular are about empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so the serious point is really that, I mean, there's, especially with spiders, there's nothing in the world that people hate as much as spiders. If I, you know, if I was to post a, a picture of a spider on um, Twitter or Facebook, amongst the comments will be someone saying, burn it with fire or something like that. And if I can, I, I, my challenge that I was setting myself is I need, I want to write a book that will have people empathizing mm -hmm. with spiders and yeah potentially and, and and siding with spiders even against humans which i think i've kind of done um but i kind of think you know spiders were the biggest challenge i don't think there's anything i could have chosen that would have been more more difficult than that but you did it and you did a great job because i was afraid of spiders i still am but I don't have the instinct of uh, kill them with fire anymore because I, I always remember Portia and Bianca and uh, yeah. Um, regarding the way of thinking of aliens, most uh, first contact stories feature aliens that have a very similar way of thinking to ours and the barrier is mostly just language. But in mm. your books, the aliens think in a really alien way, especially Paul and the others have this brain that is very strange in itself so their way of thinking is even stranger so I was wondering how hard was it to come up with something so alien and to create a society that makes sense although it really is weird <laughs> um so coming up with the actual way of thinking I mean the, the spiders were definitely easier mm -hmm. um they have a more human perspective uh, perspective um partly because I there's the way that um, solsticed spiders operate seems to lend itself to that, and partly because in the story they are more directly influenced by human sort of tinkering. Um, with the octopuses, that very nearly broke me. I think that writing the octopus um, points of view with the kind of the split cognition between the different parts of them was incredibly difficult. Um, I'm enormously indebted to a writer called Peter Godfrey Smith, who wrote a book called Other Minds, which was very much my uh, my textbook for um, sort of how octopuses uh, think and act, um, which I think I, I, I mentioned in the in the acknowledgments. But um, yeah, the oct the octopus part was extremely difficult to get inside their heads. But once I got that down with the spiders and the octopuses doing this the way the society unrolled um came fairly naturally and that's also i mean for me that's also kind of the most fun thing is working out well if they're like this what you know what do they not need to do what do they what is important to them that we don't really need we don't really worry about all of these extra little things um happen quite organically once you get into that kind of mindset and uh, when it comes to speech intelligent speeches especially 
Um, humans usually talk about our ability to recognize intelligent speech in others, but in your books, humans figure out that the spiders and the octopuses are intelligent pretty fast, but the other way around, it takes a while, and it's really humbling to read about that. So I was wondering, when we humans approach the universe, do you think we should be a bit more humble? Um, I think we should be a bit... Um less human human focused i mean one, it's one of those things um i mean it may well be that the reason we've not find found any real traces of life um in the galaxy so far and the universe so far is because the life we're looking for is far too human and obviously until we encounter some sort of um, alien life as, as personally I, I very strongly believe is out there um we won't know. Um, there are theories to, that say that life in the universe will converge on something human-like in its kind of understanding or even in its form, depending on how far you want to go. Um, but there are also theories that I find more compelling that suggest that life and even intelligence is going to arise in a, a multiplicity of different forms. I mean, we have a lot of intel. I mean, as as one of the you know, as I've written about, we have a lot of intelligent animals here on Earth. Any one of which could be here having this conversation if evolution had run a different way. I mean, this is um, another book of mine which unfortunately has not yet been translated as the Doors of Eden, which very much focuses on this idea of how evolution might have gone. Um, there's no particular reason it had to be us. There, in fact, I mean, there are a number of things about mammals and about humans and about vertebrates which actually kind of complicate getting to where we are um i mean if you look at the the, the structure of the human eye uh, we have very good eyes but also there's some very weird plumbing going on in the eye which is which we've had to kind of work around evolutionarily because we just kind of got bits backwards very early on when it was just about good enough um, alien, um intelligence out in the um in the galaxy even starting from a point from a position of um the same kind of molecular biology we've got which we know does kind of arise you know various of these molecules arise naturally um pre-life um even then it wouldn't need to be anything like us and there's no guarantee that the molecular biology couldn't be completely different sorry i've probably gone a bit off topic there but it's no 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 it's, it's... Of life. It's fascinating. And I wanted to ask, I know you studied zoology. How much has it helped or guide you in this fascination for evolution and for which animals could become intelligent and why? Uh, I mean, honestly, that kind of more goes, it's it, it almost more the other way around. I studied zoology because that interest was already there in me. And I mean, as it turned out, the zoology that I did didn't really scratch that itch. Mm -hmm. um, the behavioral aspect of zoology that I got to do was very mired in um, the approach of a, a researcher called Skinner, whose philosophy was much more the idea that animals are kind of like robots. And the idea of thinking and feeling is very much a human thing or possibly not even a human thing. I mean, there's some edge, edge of that philosophy that even goes as far as, well, maybe people are robots too and nothing really thinks or feels which is a bit reductive and also obviously for a writer, not terribly narratively useful. Um, and so I, I was very much left at the end of the, my course feeling I hadn't really got to where I wanted to go. And so I was, I, it's more my own researchers afterwards that have informed um, Children of Time and the other books. Mm. Um, regarding fake news and empathy, I have a question that uh, relates to the ability of humans to coexist with other species. Because in Children of Ruin, there's a small mention of people that are absolutely unable to live with the other societies. And one of, this is, one of the humans is really entangled in conspiracy theories. And especially in recent years, I feel like this is a very uh, important subject. And I was wondering, do you think this lack of empathy and this willingness to believe the worst in others is something hum a human trait? And if yes, can we overcome it without your the virus in your books? I mean, I think it is a human trait. I think it is also easily overcome. Um, I mean, the um, with the people in mentioned in the children in Children of Ruin, it's basically a neural architecture they have that the the virus can't overcome. 
and it's tied into um yeah i mean in in, in essence what i i kind of wanted to do looking back on it i wanted to not minimize the fact that things like phobias and so forth are very irrational and you can't necessarily just talk them out so the idea of having people that that literally couldn't get past the fact that these are spiders um seemed like a reasonable nod in that direction um one of the things about conspiracy theories uh one of the very human things about conspiracy theories is when you look at these things carefully they almost always exist to make the universe smaller mm -hmm. more easily comprehensible easier to deal with even when you know a conspiracy theory saying that there is some huge global con kind of conspiracy that is ruining the lives of people like you is actually a lot easier than the the hard fact of the universe is harsh and just effectively you know, the chaos maths of how the planet currently works is going to destroy um the things that you're that you're relying on because you feel you can fight people even a vast global conspiracy of all powerful people more you certainly could fight that more than you could fight the maths of the universe mm -hmm. effectively um and therefore that conspiracy theory is centering you it is putting you at the center of the universe um in the same way as kind of human myth making has always done and you know the idea it's easier to feel that there that you know your your kind of farm has just been flooded uh, and you've been driven off your land because the gods are angry than it is to comprehend the fact well the floods happen and the world doesn't care about you because if the gods are angry then they still care care about you even if it's in a negative fashion and i think that's that we are able to get past that kind of thinking because we have them you know i mean historically that kind of thinking is less dominant than it has been in the past and we are slowly kind of pulling ourselves out of that um almost negatively humanocentric way of um of, of sort of theorizing how the world works but it's very very tempting it's a lot easier it's a lot more comforting really to feel that there are people out there who want to destroy you rather than the universe may destroy you in passing but will never know you existed i think that's the we're almost at a, that pivot point because um, at the end of the day, all evidence suggests that the universe really doesn't know you exist. And if we don't accept that and get to grips with it, we can't really work on improving our lot beyond a certain point, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that's really meaningful. And it puts a bit of perspective on why people think in that particular way. And uh, regarding humanity, in, in the children series, Earth is ultimately destroyed by us. And your narratives, however, are very optimistic, I feel. I feel like everyone eventually finds a solution and a way to save even their home world. So I was wondering, are you an optimist? Do you think we can save the Earth eventually or we will destroy it and we'll have to find another home? um i mean honestly i i am not an optimist i try and write optimistic books though because i think overly pessimistic books don't help mm -hmm. um you know if i wrote a book saying there's no chance and we're all going to die that's not actually going to give anyone any kind of inspiration to make positive change um i mean one of the, one of the ways i write books is i do not the one thing i don't plan out is the very end mm -hmm. So the final sort of way that Children of Time ends was entirely left to what I would decide at the point I got to that point in writing the book. And so as it happens, it did turn out to have a very positive, hopeful ending, but that wasn't in any way guaranteed. Um, you know, there are certainly some considerably darker ways it could all have gone. Well, um, you know, one, one going for one side or the other. Um, but I'm very glad that I found that that positive um, resolution and it is something I like to do if I can um yeah I think it makes on, honestly I generally it makes a better story if yeah. you have a, a a positive twist it me it's more satisfying for most readers I think um as long as you can do it in a way that is actually believable I mean obviously if you suddenly have kind of a deus ex machina ending where suddenly everything is fine despite the fact that it obviously wasn't going to be then that that that's not going to work it's uh, the trick is making that happy ending that, that the book effectively supports, I suppose. 
Yeah, and I wanted to say it's fascinating because I was reading Children of Time and the ending got shorter and shorter. I was closing, uh, I was getting uh, closer to the end and I was like, wait, they have to fight, right? And yeah, it was getting closer and closer. And I, when the ending actually happened, I was completely shocked and blown away because they found a third option. And I was wondering, do you think that could happen in reality? Could we find the third option if we were to encounter or, uh, an alien race or the universe is more like a dark forest and it's kill or be killed? Um, I like to think that it's not a sort of a dark forest situation. I mean, I, I, mean, I absolutely appreciate the, log the logic of that. Um, it is one of the, I mean, this is one, I mean, it's one reason really why I talk about the prisoner's dilemma in uh, children of time it's i mean the prisons it's i go back to the prisoner's dilemma quite often um as a um as a metaphor it, it turns up in um in bearhead which is a quite important sort of um plot feature as well but it's it is the idea well what do you do um if you meet someone that you that you cannot communicate with do you trust them do you not and it's it is effectively it is a a problem that, that we've reduced to a mathematical equation. If you run enough, uh, if, if you have a long enough um, running sequence of prisoners' dilemmas, trusting is always the better result. If you have a prisoner's dilemma situation where the moment someone gets it wrong, they are completely exterminated, um, in that kind of dark forest way, then not trusting is always the the um, best result because you don't get another chance, obviously, if you get it wrong. Indeed. But that, in that sense, the odds are considerably worse than, than the traditional prisoner's dilemma kind of waiting. Um, I mean, I, to me, because I, I mean, I'm, I am very much in love with the idea of a, a diversity of life, both on this planet and in the, the universe as a whole. The risk reward is there is far too little reward in simply saying, well, we'll just kind of erase everything else and, and fill the universe with us. Because that seems to me to be a, a nothing of a future compared to becoming part of this, what of a, a wider community of sentience but obviously i think a great deal would depend on on what we met i mean it's entirely possible if we meet sort of the, a, a a species that has evolved in some sort of in a kind of hyper competitive way um like we like um like we have and is comes out of it very xenophobic and with that kind of well if we don't do it to them they'll do it to us then we, we, we may not have a great deal of choice, um, but on the other hand, I'm always very fond of um, looking at alternate um, takes on evolution. I mean, there's a book by Sue Burke called Semiosis, which deals with a plant-based ecology where the plants all have a kind of a complex symbiosis with lots of other species. And the idea that the really successful evolutionary model might be working with things rather than constantly trying to um, compete with things has a lot to be said about it. One of the things we are learning about our own evolution, the way our bodies work with our own kind of internal um, microbiome and the way that um, our cells have incorporated various other um, sort of microscopic life as they came together. So that, you know, my, mitochondria and chloroplasts and so forth were all originally independent organisms that, that have kind of been domesticated by ourselves at a very early time time in evolution there's a there's a lot to be said to say that the the true great leaps of success and success stories of evolution are actually a cooperation not of kind of nature red and tooth and claw yeah and i think the way you view this particular aspect of life is really visible in the ending of children of ruin because they find a way to to work together and regarding endings, I feel like both the children series books have a very satisfying ending. You feel like this could be the end, 
but then you come back and you write more and it's even more amazing and it expands the universe but you have a lot of series going on so what makes you come back what what makes you go back and write more in a series I'm, I'm going to be very impolitic and say that one of the big things that makes me go back and write more in a series is having sold a large number of books <laughs> um I mean, what, I mean, I do. I have a lot of different series on the go, and I have a lot of different sort of standalone books that could conceivably have a sequel, which is obviously where Children of Time was was sitting. It wasn't intended as one of a series, but I always try and leave a, a door at the end that I can through which I can go to another book. Um, but each time I'm pitching a new book, I've got to go to the publisher and say I'd like to write this, and they will look at it and say, "Well, can we can we sell that?" And sequels are tricky because you always get diminishing returns. Not everyone who reads book one will read book two, but everyone who reads book two must have read book one. Mm -hmm. And so every book in a series, a series you get this slightly lower level of readership. And, you know, I, mean, I feel, um, so the first thing I wrote was the, uh, the Shadows of the App series, which ended up with 10 volumes. And I feel that that is actually a lot of books. I don't think I'll do 10, 10 volumes of anything again. And I'm kind of amazed they let me get away with it. And I'm always I'm always delighted to hear you know someone said they've read the whole series they've read the tenth book because I you know you always there's always I mean I know as a reader myself there are plenty of series I think well I'll get back to that someday but I've still got like three those last three books I will read at some point but there was a bit of a gap between this book and that book and then I never got back into that series and it happens for all sorts of reasons. Um, so uh, yes, with, I mean with the children, but they were just successful enough I knew that you know if I went to the publisher and said I'd like to write another one of these they would be absolutely delighted and there wouldn't be any argument about um getting it into print which obviously you know, Children of Ruin has done well enough that the third book is coming out in English at the end of this year I think yeah that's really great news and I'm not complaining that you're going back to this series because I really really loved it and I'm very excited to see what more uh, you're going to add to the universe and um, I have a question about publishing. Mm -hmm. um, it took you 15 years to get published. And in that time, you wrote many, many books. Is there anything there that could be used today? Is there any idea left in your drawer that you would like to revisit now that you have more experience and you understand publishing a bit better? Well, I have already, I've already done that exercise. Uh, I've gone back through uh, the back catalog sort of in reverse order. So the two books that came before Empire in Black and Gold, which was the first one to get published back in 2008, um, they are now both in print, having been substantially rewritten. Um, the book before that was simply not good enough to repay the effort. Um, and that was a bit of a, an eye opener for me because as when I was writing all of these books, you know, all the way back through 15 years, so that's like another 10 or so books. Um, I really believe every single one of them was absolutely made of gold. And looking back at it now, I think actually, no, I, I, I mean, it wasn't the first sort of properly readable book that I wrote that got published, but it wasn't far off. It was within a couple. And so a lot of, you know, for most of that time, I was getting rejected by publishers for the very good reason the books weren't very good. You know, I mean, it's one of those, I, the ideas are fine. And in some cases, those ideas have been kind of pirated for later books. Um, but it's just the writing style is the key thing. The writing style makes all the difference um, because that's the thing that the reader is constantly, you know, it's the difference between kind of driving along a, um, a smooth road and driving on off, off, off road across a sort of a bumpy field. And what helped you figure out how to smooth your road? Um, two, well, two things, reading, reading lots and lots of books so you know and, and just sort of absorbing good technique from good writers but also just writing um just the biggest thing is just continuing to write every every book i wrote i think was just a bit better than the previous book uh and i, th I think my some writers will basically write the same book over and over again um i wrote i you know i wrote and submitted and then i wrote something completely different each time and i think for me that was the right the right idea because honestly starting from scratch and just right you know going beginning to end on a completely new project is probably the best way for me to sort of stretch myself as a writer and improve my skill and what helped you persevere through all of these rejections for 15 years it's 
you're a success story, but yeah, yes, we want to know the, your the world, secret. The world's longest overnight success. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I but what what helped me persevere was this was the only thing I wanted to do. Everything else I've done in my life has kind of been to pay the rent, um, and the writing was the thing from about the age of 17 18 the writing was the thing i knew i wanted to do and it was the thing i was trying to do and yeah you know, i was i was submitting terrible terrible books to absolutely the wrong publishers at about age 17 and i just didn't stop um and i think it's most you know i even even now i can go about two weeks without writing after which i just get so twitchy about not having produced something i've got to get back to it yeah, you, you're a very prolific author, and uh, you will recently publish a, a book set in the Warhammer universe. And having worked in such an extended universe, I wanted to, to ask, do you think any of your books could be turned into a video game or a movie that would make them so uh, other writers would write in your universe? Would you like that to happen? Um, it would be very flattering if so. I mean, I've had a couple of experiences of that purely within books. So um, there is a collection of short stories by um, a number of different authors set in the shadows of the apt um, universe and i wrote a book called redemption's blade um, for rebellion which was specifically i will write the first book in a series and then the series will get passed on so i had to write the book and then i wrote a kind of a complete sort of document saying all the all the things i put in the book and all the characters and languages and cultures and all that sort of thing for, for the, the next writers to use um the warhammer stuff it was different because obviously i was coming to, to a universe that had decades of um law and that was that was um a real education because they they are very very tight on edit on editing they're very keen to make sure everything fits within the universe so um suddenly my first my first warhammer short story got a lot of back and forwards with the concepts, you know, and I would say, well, how about this? And they said, no, that literally does not fit into the universe at all. And you, you've got to find a completely different way around it. Um, my, fa my favorite there was, I, I had a reference to a, a, a nice agricultural planet in my first story. And they wrote back saying, no, no none of the planets are nice in this universe. They're all horrible. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, I mean, that that's, it's the only, um, franchise I've, I've i've actually ri I've written in and it was a really different experience just right you know writing my own stuff with that kind of creative freedom it's, i mean sometimes writing with those uh, restrictions is a very good way of getting the imagination going because you have to think of different ways around problems with the ones you'd normally use and i know you're an author that likes to set the world first and then comes the rest of the story so um when you set the world how much time do you dedicate to this like this is the bulk of of writing that you do and then you just sort of carve away uh, the excess or is this a small part at the beginning because you have a lot of experience and then you just focus on the story and the characters um so usually it's kind of a two-part if i have an idea it'll have been bubbling away for quite some time you know months and months in my head while i'm working on other projects and i mean at the moment i've got probably seven or eight different um, ideas, you know, some of which I'll have made notes on, some of which will just purely be in here, just kind of percolating. Um, and then when I come to start the book, I'll probably take about a week or two weeks just to write down just this long list of you know, what's going on in the universe, who are the, who are the people, who are the factions, what are the customs, what are the, what are the rules basically of the setting just so I can fix it in place in my head. And at that point, after that, it'll be about another week or so to hammer out plot, plot and main characters. And then I'll be ready at that point. I'll, have, I'll be, it, it was like I'll have, I'll have wheeled the go-kart up to the top of the hill. And then it's just whoosh and off. Okay. And uh, one last question. Um, I read that you have a cat, so I was wondering, do you think that cats will become our overlords, or are they already <laughs> the masters of humanity? <laughs> oh, there's a whole, well, there's a whole bit in Doors of Eden about um, cats, cats taking over. That's one of the, uh, the evolutionary sort of stories you get in there. But, oh, cats, cats are weird. Cats are, it's um, one of those things about when people talk about, well, humans domesticated this or that animal. Of course, domestication is always a two-way process. 
I mean, yes, we domesticated dogs, but to a certain extent, dogs also taught us taught taught us to look after dogs. I mean, dogs have done very well out of the uh, the process. I mean, even even animals that we actually eat, um, you know, they're kind of their genetic security is kind of assured for as long as we actually what I actually um, need them. And yeah, I think it's it's cats are where it's most it's most um, explicit because they do seem to have ret retained a certain amount of independence um from pe from from people in a way that other domestic animals haven't and we seem and they've somehow convinced us to let them have that <laughs> okay thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing so many insights about the wonderful worlds you have created and well, uh, thank you very much for having me